Right, um, this is a little presentation about the, the PRB, the pre like Brotherhood, and I've called it more than just a brotherhood, uh, looking at the relationships within the pre raphaelite Brotherhood and their models and their muses um, through a selection of their paintings. My personal interest in the PRB goes back, way back, to my childhood in Liverpool and my granddad, Fred. And there he is, sitting on the wall of the old swimming pool, as was in Hoylake. Fred was a lovely guy, um, which is quite amazing, really, because during the First World War, he was, he was a runner. He was a very lithe little guy. Before the First World War, he was training to be a jockey. So naturally, when the war started, they made him a runner. And he would run between trenches, um, carrying messages from officer to officer. And in the end, they gave him a motorcycle. And he was riding between trenches one day with um, satchels full of grenades on the back of his bike. And a shell went off near uh, and it, it, it uh, detonated the, uh, the grenades on his bike and threw him into uh, a trench and buried him. And he was buried alive for three days on the Somme. And it was only because they needed the trench again that they dug it out and they found him. Now, if that had happened to me, I mean, I would have just gone mad, I guess. But he just came back from the war and he was my granddad. Um, he was very much a self-educated man. Uh, he used to read a lot, um, but he didn't have a great deal of money. So on Sundays, mainly when we would go down and visit my, my, my grandparents, and that, that's me there and my brother, as you can probably see, also at Hoylake, um, he would take me into town. On, if he had a couple of pence to spare, he would take me into town um, on the tram. And we'd either go to the museum, and he'd show me around the museum, or he'd take me into the Walker Art Gallery. Uh, which he loved, and he would take me round the round the paintings. And those of you who remember from our trip to Liverpool, um, the Walker Art Gallery's got one of the best collections of pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood paintings actually in the world. And these entranced me since I was eight or nine because they, they were mainly narrative paintings. They used to have a story behind them or a story attached to them. And my granddad would stand us in front of the paintings and he would tell us the story of the painting. Um, it was a story he'd made up. He didn't really know anything about them at all. But those, I loved those stories that he used to tell us about the paintings. Um, I loved them because, first of all, the women were beautiful and their stories were enhanced uh, by my granddad's uh, stories, even though they were, they were his versions, if you like, and that they were the ones that were made up. So that was the beginning, if you like, of my interest in the, in the PRB. And even when I was an art student in Liverpool, uh, when it was not de rigueur at all to be interested in the PRB, I still maintained an interest. OK, who were they? Just a, this is just by way of a little bit of background. Um, if you want something to watch on a dark night, then I suggest that you have a look at that mini-series made by the BBC in 2009 called Desperate Romantics. And that's just about the relationships between the PRB and the muses. You can get, you can get it, in fact, on Amazon or you can get it on Net, Netflix or, or indeed iPlayer too. Um, it's it's quite, worth, quite worth a look. If you want to read about them, um, then the definitive work on the PRB relationships is that book there, Pre-Raphaelites in Love by Gay Daly. Um, she researched them for her PhD. Uh, she's, she's a university teacher now of English and Women's Studies. And that's quite a detailed presentation of the uh, intimate affairs, if you like, between uh, the PRB and their muses and their models. Right, who were they? Well, the PRB were a group of English painters, poets, 
and Critics that was founded in 1848. And there were three initial founders. The first one was William Holman Hunt. And there's a, a portrait, a self-portrait of Holman Hunt and also a photograph of him too. The next one was John Everett Millay. And there again, a drawing and a photograph, one, an early photograph of uh, John Millay. And the last one, Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Again, a drawing. I think, I'm not quite sure about that. I, th I think that's a self-portrait. Um, but on the other side, there is also a photograph of him too. Now, those three uh, were the founding members of the PRB, but they were soon joined uh, by four other artists. You had um, William Michael Rossetti here, James Collinson is here, Frederick George Stevens and Thomas Woolner. And they were expanded later on by Edward Byrne, Byrne Jones and William Morris. Uh, these were both apprenticed to Rossetti. Ford Maddox Brown, another artist, was also closely associated with the PRB, especially through his relationship with, um, with Rossetti. Now, a little background information about them. Their intention as a group was to reform art, to reform especially painting, uh, by rejecting the what's called the manneristic approach to painting. They claim that the classical poses, if you like, and elegant compositions of artists that came after Raphael had corrupted the academic teaching of art. And so they call themselves the pre-Raphaelites. They hark back to more naturalistic uh, and less posed imaging that you got before Ra uh, Raphael and Michelangelo. They didn't, particularly, they didn't like the work of Joshua Reynolds. They called him Sir Sloshua. There are two more uh, paintings by Sir Sloshua Reynolds demonstrating some of the formal mannerist and classical designs uh, they are, that were abhorred by the PRB. These, partic these stances, classical stances, if you like, uh, marked out by these triangulations. There, there, and there. Typical classical poses for, for paintings that they abhorred. There's another one, that's a painting of the Holy Family in the Carpenter's Shop by Tassel. And you can see there again, these formal relationships set up um, as any classically trained painter might do uh, post-Raphael. The Brotherhood believed that the classical poses and the elegant posed compositions of Raphael in particular uh, had been a corrupting influence in the academic teaching of art. In particular, they rejected the influence of Sir Joshua Reynolds and his work. Joshua Reynolds was the founder of the Royal Academy of Arts. They wanted to return to the abundant natural detail, intense colours and complex compositions of pre-Raphaelite painting. And there's the first of them. That is the Holy Family in the carpenter's shop, and it was painted by John Millet. And you'll notice there that in the main, all the formal classical compositional elements have been rejected. That painting there, the Holy Family in the carpenter's shop, the first one, broke all the classical rules of composition. And the painting, when it became public, was slated by the critics. And because the critics slated it, the public in general also slated it. A prominent public figure attacked the rendering of Christ here, the painting of Christ, as a hideous, wry-necked, blubbering, redhead boy in a bedgown. And the figure of Mary as a woman so hideous in her ugliness that she would stand out from the rest of the company as a monster in the vilest cabaret of, in France or the lowest gin shop in England. Now that's fairly withering um, criticism. Because of that criticism, the movement was doomed right from the start or could have been doomed to failure and ridicule. 
Now, that prominent public figure was Charles Dickens, and he set the tone. However, now enter John Ruskin. Now, John Ruskin was the leading art, English art critic of the Victorian era. And as well as being an art patron, a draftsman, a watercolorist, and philosopher, he was also a prominent social thinker and a philanthropist to boot. Now, he had, John Ruskin had serious personal and social problems. He really did. But the most fashionable people listened to his opinion. And there was a letter that he wrote to the Times about this new school of painting. And he wrote, and so I wish them all heartily good speed, believing in sincerity that if they temper the courage and energy which they've shown in the adoption of their system with patience and discretion in pursuing it, and if they do not suffer themselves to be driven by harsh or careless criticism into rejection of the ordinary means of obtaining influence over the minds of others, they may, as they gain experience, lay in our England the foundations of a school of art nobler than the world has seen for 300 years. Very, very positive criticism. That letter shut down all criticism of their philosophy and it guaranteed them a glittering future. But like any young pop stars, it opened up all kinds of personal possibilities. And so it starts. There's a picture there of Effie Ruskin. She was Effie Gray and she was 19 years old when that was painted. And that was the year uh, in which she married John Ruskin. And again, some of you might have seen this actually, it was on the, it was on the telly a couple of weeks ago. That's a film about Effie Gray. Uh, you probably find it on Catch Up or whatever on, on the BBC. And that gives a great um, portrait, if you like, of the relationship between the two of them, especially the way Effie was abused, if you like. Now, Effie met John Millet after five years of her marriage to Ruskin. Now, she'd been married for five years, but she was still a virgin. She actually signed a non-consummation contract uh, to allow Ruskin to further his studies without any carnal distraction. So in other words, you're not doing it for the next five years so that I can continue my studying. Ruskin had a thing about the female form. He was entranced by um, classical figurative um, sculpture and that kind of thing. But when he came across the real thing, he was actually disgusted. He was reportedly disgusted by her femininity. He was disgusted by pubic hair. He was disgusted by menstruation and so on. So really, he didn't have a relationship at all with his young wife. There is a picture called Waterfall or Effie at Glenfinless. That was painted by Millet in 1853. Millet accompanied um, Ruskin and Effie on a holiday to Brigaterk in Scotland in order to paint Ruskin's portrait. Ruskin wished to study the geology of the area, which he did extensively. But at the same time, Millet and Effie studied each other extensively. On her return to London, Effie filed for an annulment of her marriage. And this was allowed in 1854 on the grounds of, quote, incurable impotency, unquote. Now, John and Effie married uh, after she was divorced, or not, the marriage was annulled, in 1855, and they had eight children together. Ruskin continued with his studies, and Millet finished Ruskin's portrait, amicably, believe it or not. If you go back and have a look at that portrait there, it's actually an awful portrait. And that was mainly because it was painted in two halves. When they were at Brigaterk, uh, Millet painted the background. 
which is reasonable, I suppose. Um, and then when they came back to London, uh, Millet painted the um, portrait of Ruskin over the background. And it see, if you look at it carefully, it just looks like a paper cutout that's been stuck onto the background. There are no shadows, no shade, no nothing at all. I mean, it might be a reasonable painting of Ruskin, but in general terms, it's not a good painting at all. Nevertheless, many of the PRB paintings took their inspiration from poems, from poetry by Keats, Tennyson, Shakespeare, and so on. And many of them in, involved allusions to fallen women and the masculine dominance over the weaker sex. So Millet's first exhibition work in the, for the, in the PRB style is a painting called Lorenzo and Isabella, and it was based on John Keats' poem, Isabella. I won't go through that in any detail. Uh, Isabella or, or the Pot of Basil is a narrative poem by John Keats, and is adopted from a story, uh, the story from Boccaccio's uh, Decameron. It tells the tale of a young woman whose family intended to marry her to some high noble and his olive trees, but who falls for Lorenzo, one of her brother's employees. When the brothers learn about this, they murder Lorenzo and bury his body. His ghost informs Isabella in a dream. She exhumes the body and buries the head in a pot of basil, which she tends obsessively while pining away. Now, we'll see this uh, painting later. There's Millet's painting of Isabella, of the scene of it. The models for that painting were people Millet knew, including and especially a bully from his school, the guy there front and centre. Um, he's maybe Lorenzo's murderer. But the painting's interesting if you study it in a little detail. There he is seen kicking Isabella's dog, uh, showing attempted male dominance, but you see the shadow between his legs. That's an erect penis and it's spilling salt. He's also cracking nuts. Now then, Lizzie Siddle. That's a photograph of Lizzie. Uh, she was a milliner's assistant in London, and she was employed as a model by the PRB. She was evidently very striking, and well, as you can see from the, from the uh, photograph. She was tall, she was beautiful, and she had masses of red hair. Most of you will recognize that painting there. That's Ophelia by Millet. And that was modeled <coughs> by Lizzie Siddle. For the painting, Lizzie was posed in a tin bath of water to represent the drowning Ophelia. Uh, the tin bath was warmed underneath with oil lamps. Sadly, the lamps went out. The water that she was lying in became icy cold. Millet didn't notice this. He was so engrossed with his painting. She didn't complain, but she became very ill after lying in the cold bath for so long. But uh, Millet did pay her doctor's bills, which was very nice of him. Lizzie became the primary model and muse for Rossetti in the early PRB years. And he married her uh, many years later. However, while Lizzie was away in Europe, because of her ill health, Rossetti had many, many affairs with his other models. But that's a painting called Found by Millet. And the model here was Fanny Cornforth. She was described as an illiterate Cockney prostitute. The painting was uh, an attempt to explore the contemporary at the time topic of prostitution. He wrote a poem about that, about her, uh, and he called it Jenny. And uh, he had a long affair with Fanny, really lasting, lasting all of his wife. That there is a narrative picture. Uh, what it is, in fact, it's a, a farmer, um, been living on his farm. His sister ran away from the farm um, in order to pursue the good life in the town. She was rejected because she became a prostitute. He uh, came up from the farm, uh, you can see his uh, little cart here in the background, to um, 
to sell his lamb and found his sister and eventually took her back to the farm where she belonged. You notice this is an alleg allegorical thing too. The lamb is netted in the uh, cart, just as his sister has been netted, if you like, in the big city. The model here in this painting by Rossetti, the model is Fanny Cornforth. The painting's called Boca Bacchiata, and it represents a turning, turning point, if you like, in Rossetti's career. This is the first of his pictures of the female figure. Um, the style was to become the signature of his style of working. Uh, the title means mouth that has been kissed and refers to the sexual experience of the subject. Uh, if you have a look in the bottom right corner there, you can see a red apple. That possibly an allusion to Eve, who brought uh, Adam down in the Garden of Eden. And there's a drawing of Fanny, again by Rossetti. Now to Annie Miller. Annie Miller was very poor, another very poor girl. She was working as a barmaid when Holman Hunt discovered her. She was uneducated, she was unkempt, she was a street urchin, lice risen, wild and filthy. Holman Hunt funded her education. He wanted to mould her into a lady and marry her. Uh, the touch of my fair lady there, if you like. She was his muse. While Hunt was working abroad, she posed for Rossetti. Inevitably, an affair ensued. Lizzie, when she, when she got back, became aware of this liaison and threw all the drawings of Annie out of the window. And there is Helen of Troy by Rossetti, modelled by Annie. And there's a photograph and, uh, of Annie Miller and an image by Rossetti. You'll notice that these photographs don't bear very much resemblance to these women. The women themselves are a lot plainer than the beautiful paintings that were painted of them. Next, Alexa Wilding. There's a photograph of Alexa there. And there is uh, the painting, The Garlanded Woman, again by Rossetti. You'll notice one of the uh, trademarks, the hallmarks, if you like, of these paintings are the beautiful full Cupid's bow lips, which aren't really there in the original. Now, unusually for Rossetti, the relationship between the artist and the model remained entirely professional. Now, back to Lizzie Siddle. After the bath incident and her subsequent illness, she suffered continuous uh, ill health. And because of the medicine that she was taking, which was laudanum, she became addicted. Uh, she was acutely depressed after a stillbirth while she was married to Rossetti. Um, prenatal depression, I guess it, it was. Um, and she took an overdose of laudanum and died. Suicide at that time was illegal which was a bit ridiculous, really, but there you go. Um, so it was judged to be kind to it, if you like, as, accidental, as an accidental death, an accidental overdose, but it wasn't. And <laughs> this is interesting. Rossetti um, had written a series of poems for Lizzie during their relationship. I, I'm not going to read that because it goes on and on and on and on, and it's not the most wonderful poetry in the world by any means. He might have been a great painter. He was not a great poet. So Rossetti was distraught after her death, and he put the only copy of the poems that he'd written for her in her coffin. That painting there, Blessed Beatrice, was painted, was a painting after Dante's Vita Nuova. He attempts to draw a parallel between Dante Alighieri's and his own deep grief at the deaths of their own loves. The red bird that you can see here in the painting is a, a messenger of death, and it's got an opium poppy in its beak. And there is a grave as it stands today. However, 
Enter Jane Morris. There's a photograph of Jane there. Uh, you remember she's the wife of William Morris, and she became Rossetti's muse after the death of Lizzie. Over time, he became obsessed with Jane. So much so that the obsession led to Rossetti having Lizzie's coffin exhumed so that he could retrieve his poetry. <laughs> he added more poems for Jane and had them published. And there, Pandora's box is the, uh, the model for this painting was Jane. Persephone by Rossetti, or Proserpine as he called it. He painted at least eight paintings of Proserpine who was Jane, of course, and he also wrote a sonnet to accompany them. However, Jane distanced herself from Rossetti when he, he also became addicted. He became addicted to chloral hydrate, which was a recreational drug in Victorian times. But faithful Fanny Cornforth continued to be there for him until his family stopped her when he was dying. So now, Emma Watkins. There's a painting by William Holman Hunt, the hireling shepherd, and the model for that was Emma Watkins. Emma was used, evidently, for her exotic features, but the painting was criticised because of her fiery red skin and wiry hair, which was very peasant-like. The painting was condemned for its vulgarity. Go back to Annie Miller. There, The Awakening Conscience. You probably, you probably remember that one. Uh, that painting by Holman Hunt. The model here is Annie Miller. It's a controversial painting uh, because it depicts women being used by middle-class men. She is a courtesan, if you like. She's, been, she's a kept woman. You can tell that because of the modern furniture, um, the beautiful setting and so on. But she is coming to an understanding of what's actually happening to her and is not happy about it at all. She is a mistress. She's not a wife because she hasn't, uh, she's not wearing a wedding ring. Um, so she suddenly coming to an awakening to the fact that she that that's precisely what she is. She is a kept woman. Evidently, um, Holman Hunt repainted the face of the woman at the request of the patron, who wasn't comfortable with the original look of horror on her face. Another one by Holman Hunt, Sweet Doing Nothing. This was initially painted with Annie Miller as the model. Uh, Annie evidently rejected Holman Hunt after waiting years for him to marry her. And she married evidently a well-connected young man with a house in Mayfair. Hunt finally met his future wife, Fanny War, who was the daughter of a prosperous London chemist. So he scraped out the face of Annie and replaced it with Fanny's. <laughs> there is Isabella and the Pot of Basil. Uh, that I alluded to before, right at the beginning. Um, that's actually in the um, art gallery in Newcastle. Isabella there was modelled by his wife, Fanny, and based on Keats' poem of the same name. And there is the pot of basil up here, with the head of her lover buried in it, and the basil growing out of the top. Isabella puts the head of her lover in a pot, and grows basil in it. It was evidently modelled while Fanny was pregnant. It's a very tiring pose, it would seem. Fanny soon gave birth to a son, but it was a difficult birth. She developed a fever and she died six weeks after this painting was finished. At the end of his poem, uh, the lovers are united in death which is what Hunt, Hunt wished for too. But, yeah, you guessed it, Hunt went on to have a love affair with Edith. That's Edith War, Fanny's sister. 
he would see him propose marriage, uh, but it was illegal in Britain at the time to marry your dead wife's sister. Nevertheless, she had his baby and they were married in Switzerland. The marriage wasn't legal in Britain until 1907. And in the painting there, Triumph of the Innocents, Edith is the virgin and the baby that they had between them is the Christ child. And there's Edith, photograph of her and the painting of her. Now, Georgiana Byrne-Jones. There's a painting by Edward Byrne-Jones of his wife, Georgiana. She was evidently a woman of good education and from a good family. And he painted their son and daughter in, in the background there. However, enter Maria Zambarco. There's Maria, a photograph of her, and her portrait by Byrne Jones. Again, just a passing resemblance between the two of them. There's Bourne Jones painting Pan and Psyche. The model was Maria Zambarco, who was a Greek. He had a passionate affair with Maria and described it as the emotional climax of his life. They planned to elope to France, but he was torn between his lover and his family. Maria threatened suicide and tried, in, uh, and tried to drown herself in Regent Canal in London. In the painting there, Pan comforts Psyche after she tries to drown herself. A parallel, if you like, between their relationship in real life. Phyllis and Demophoon, again, a painting by Byrne Jones. The female model was, again, Maria Zambarco. Phyllis there hangs herself because her love doesn't return to her. Because of the public knowledge of the Byrne Jones Zambarco affair and the painting's overt male nudity, it caused a scandal and was eventually withdrawn from exhibition. And inevitably, Ben Jones stays with his wife, Georgiana. However, you kind of get the picture there that these are poor, used women, um, two-dimensional people who were just used by their artists. Uh, that, that actually wasn't true. However, the, the women uh, who were the painter's models were central to the, the whole PRB endeavor. Some were plucked from obscurity, sure. Others were sisters, wives, and friends of the artists. And several of the, art, several of the women were artists themselves. Lizzie Siddle, Jane Morris, Maria Zambarco were each uh, very reasonable artists or craftspeople. Although their backgrounds and life experience was varied widely, all of them were engaged in creating and steering pre-Raphaelite art. They were very, very important. They were not background people. Well, I'll play you a short video here, which talks about Jane Morris and the kind of artist she was. An evening out to the theatre in 1857 would prove life-changing for a young Jane Burden. It was there she was spotted by two pre-Raphaelite artists, Rossetti and Byrne Jones, and reluctantly agreed to pose for a mural they were painting for the Oxford Union, along with another young artist, William Morris. A year later, William and Jane were married. As he struggled with the only painting he ever made of her, he said, I cannot paint you, but I love you. A year after they were married, they moved here to Red House in Bexley Heath. It was here that Jane Morris developed her skills as an embroiderer. Jane Morris took on the painstaking task of creating embroidered wall hangings for Red House. Working alongside her husband, she produced designs, embroideries and textiles, many of which would go on to become the iconic recognisable images of Morris & Co. As well as textiles, designs were translated onto stencils to use on wallpapers, ceilings, furniture, glassware and metalware. Red House was soon filled with enthusiastic collaborators. They were regularly visited by the pre-Raphaelite artists like Elizabeth Siddle, Rossetti, Ford Maddox Brown and Byrne Jones. 
They all contributed to the creativity of Red House and eventually led them to create their own company, Morrison Co. It was also here that Jane's two children were born. Her daughter, May, would learn from her mother to become a skilled textile designer and embroiderer, making her one of the leading designers of the arts and crafts movement. Despite her long-standing marriage to William Morris, Jane would go on to become the main muse and obsessive love of Dante Gabriel Rossetti. He immortalised her in some of the most famous pre-Raphaelite paintings in the world, depicting heroines among myths, stories, and legends, like Proustian and Desdemona. Jane spent her later years here at Helmscott House, on the banks of the Thames in Hammersmith, creating textile designs with her daughter May. Although you might recognise Jane from pre raphaelite paintings, her skills as an embroiderer and her contribution to the arts and crafts movement establish her as more than a meat. So there you go. There were more than just muses, more than just models. And I would say, more power to their elbow. Okay. There we are. Just a little taste. A little taste of uh, the PRV and their relationships with their women.